I think we're there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, today's presentation, everyone. And I will pass it over to John. There we go, John. All yours. Okay. Thanks very much, Keith, uh, Brenton. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Right. So, like Keith said, this is a presentation titled Safety in Construction and Lessons for Management of Carbon Emissions. So, uh, I'll start just by saying a bit about myself. So, I'm a civil engineer uh, who now is really focused on, on climate change. Uh, I think it's important to note straight away that my background isn't in health and safety. So, I, I and presenting my experience of health and safety from a, a, a civil engineer, construction manager slash project management perspective. Um, and what I'm really interested in going forward for myself is what lessons um, for carbon management and climate change can be learned from the health and safety management industry. So that's really what this talk is about. So it's a bit about my experiences and why I think that there are lessons to be learned uh, for climate change. Right, so like I said, my background is uh, construction. I've worked in quite a lot of different industries, which I think are relevant when we think about health and safety and how it's managed by in different, in different sectors. So I've worked in, in rail, nuclear, so this was a project at Sellafield. Uh, that's the uh, BP chemical plant in Hull, where I was uh, for, uh, briefly for a project. Uh, and I worked in oil and gas, so this is uh, projects I did in Australia. I did a similar, another project similar to that one in Australia as well. Uh, this is a liquefied natural gas export uh, facilities, which really in the news now with uh, countries wanting to import uh, LNG in, in, in lieu of Russian gas. Uh, so it was a big, there was a big gas boom in Australia, and uh, I did a couple of projects out there. And then similarly, this this project was in uh, Papua New Guinea, so the same same part of the world. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree, quite impressive. This was almost finished at this stage when this photograph was taken. Um, now I don't like to boast too much, but I actually was involved in this in this part of the project here, which hopefully you can just about make out on this uh, on this image. I did a little bit on the main jetty as well, but uh, I'm going to talk a bit probably more about my involvement in this uh, in this little structure here. Uh, this is another marine project. Uh, it was a container terminal in, in Costa Rica. And then really my overseas adventures came to an end and I, I came back to the UK and I focused more on buildings than on, on sort of civil construction. Um, so I've been involved in, in fire risk assessments and more recently uh, energy efficiency, so retrofit of existing buildings. So I, I've included this image uh, to kind of remind me to mention both things, so fire risk assessments because it's got a fire extinguisher there, I thought that would uh, remind me. Uh, just a bit of background on the, uh, the presentation. Um, uh, I'm getting on a bit now. When I first entered the workplace and started putting PowerPoints together, the big thing was don't put too much text on the slides. So then um, all my presentations were always like just lots of bullet points. So I thought I was doing the right thing, you know, keep it short. You can cut out the ands and the there's, uh, keep it bulleted. But but now when you look at presentation guys, they always say no bullet points. And you know, engineers just love putting bullet points in uh, in PowerPoints. So I'm try so I'll try to use a lot of images this time to just uh, jog my memory enough so I can talk without needing a lot of bullet points. Okay, so. Um, I, I include this slide later on, but I thought I'd bring it in as part of the, introdu like, part of the introduction. Um, so I said I'm interested in climate change. So a few years ago, I, I started a, a master's course online at the University of Edinburgh, so car carbon management. And I've kept my focus where I can on, on the built environment and construction and buildings sectors. Um, and now it's come time to do my dissertation. Um, so the topic I've chosen is, uh, the, uh, there's a couple of research questions within it, but this one is relevant here, which is, which methods, techniques and learnings employed over many years to improve health and safety in construction could help the sector achieve its climate related objectives? So my hypothesis is that, I'm good, so basically I'm going to be doing interviews with civil engineers, and I'm going to be asking them about what they think we can learn from health and safety. And my hypothesis is there'll be a, um, there'll be a role for targets to play, but probably more importantly, like a positive culture. Um, and 
I'm also interested in the diff different team members within a project and what how the roles um, may differ in terms of managing climate change. So I've got a lot of slides here, which is just images from projects I worked on where I've got little anecdotes and experiences from, from related to health and safety. And like I say, I wasn't a health and safety manager. I was a civil engineer, but I obviously I had to manage health and safety within my role and responsibility. Um, and I you know, obviously took an interest in it enough to do my, to do my job. Um, so rail in the UK, um, I saw a couple of years ago, I think it is now, that Network Rail would, to replace all human lookouts on rail, after a railway worker died. Um, and this jogged my memory because I did, I did some work on the railways and down in London and used lookouts. So the, the job I had to do was inspecting earthworks. So at that time, Network Rail didn't have any record of their earthworks, like cuttings and, tunnel, uh, cuttings and embankments. So we had to basically walk the railway lines and, and log these structures. Um, so I did it in the Yorkshire area, and generally we didn't need any lookouts because the, it, it comes down to how far you can see up the track. So these were live tracks, not high speed. Um, so you, you have to stay away from the line as, as much as you can and obviously keep an eye out for trains. Down in London, there was a lot of lines where the visibility wasn't enough for one person to work on their own. So you needed a, a safety team. So the safety team would comprise what they call the COS, which is a control of site safety, and working with two lookouts. So I'd be essentially in the middle, and there'd be a lookout certain distance up the track on either side. So you could basically see in round bends uh, to check, so you have enough visibility for a train coming. Um, and my anecdote for this was, it's a, it seems like a good system. Obviously it has failed in this, in, in this incident here where, where someone died. My experience also wasn't too wasn't too good. Um, this line I was working on on this day was quite quiet, and um, you know, so there wasn't a lot happening. And for the lookouts and the, and the cars, it's probably quite a boring job. I was busy logging my earthworks. We were using this is back in this is like 20 years ago, so it's before iPad, but we had this this handheld computer, which is kind of like an iPad device. And I remember we had a GPS module on our shoulder, so we were automatic, it was automatically logging our position um, on the on the line. And um, I got used to working on my own and having to keep a constant lookout for trains coming. And um, the lookout team, as we were walking along this track, uh, they'd come across an old football and uh, decided to start having a kickabout on the side of the track. And uh, um, I, was, I was merrily like doing my job. And I looked up and I noticed there was a train coming and I had to notify these guys that there was a train coming. You know, so make sure you have to stand. I think it's two meters back from the track. Uh, so yeah, I just remember thinking at that time as a young engineer, I think the lookouts were probably getting paid more than me, and the cars certainly was. And um, their job, I guess, was quite boring. And, and uh, so, I, so I, I've, I've put this under like rules versus culture. So I think the rules were there, but the the culture probably the safety culture probably wasn't uh, wasn't good enough. Certainly not on on that day with that with those guys. And then moving on to PPE then, so PPE is obviously the last line of defence. Um, and I've got a couple of anecdotes about, about habits and the importance of habits. So the first site job I had, I remember being given some gloves to wear. I was told that when you're out on site, you have to wear gloves. And I remember, I remember questioning this because um, I wasn't used to wearing gloves. And I was an engineer, so I wasn't on the tools as such. Uh, I had to use a theodolite and I was setting out the works, you know, positioning where things were going to be built. And it just didn't seem like a job where I should be having to wear gloves. So I do remember questioning it. And to start with, I didn't like having to wear gloves. But it did, it, I do remember maybe a few months after realizing that I'd actually got to rely on the gloves and that when I didn't have gloves on, whenever it was, so maybe I was doing some work on my car or something. And then I started wearing gloves in my, off my own, of my own choice. So I'd got used to them. I'd got into the habit of wearing gloves and, and suddenly I felt a little bit exposed, you know, that my hands were in danger if I didn't have gloves on. And I just remember noting that how I questioned it to start with. Um, and yet my perception of risk basically changed um, and I was now in the habit of wearing gloves. The hard hat, so that relates to this picture of the barge. So this was a job in Australia and um, I didn't take this photograph. I'm assuming the person was in a man, uh, a, a proper personnel uh, man cage who took the photograph. 
But the the guy in the cab of this crane is likely to be a guy called Jerry because he was always the, the driver of this um, of this crane, and uh, he was involved in a near miss. And basically, we think that the hard hat might have saved his life. And what it was is the crane was at this end of the track, so it's got these these um, can't remember exactly what you call them, but these tracks have been placed on the barge deck, and this train uh, this crane could track up and down. Um, it was at this end of the of the barge and this is the these are the site cabins where the guys used to go for lunch and the rules were in while he's in his cab jerry doesn't have to wear a hard hat when he's in the porter cabin he doesn't have to wear a hard hat but any other times when he's on the barge deck he has to wear a, a life jacket and a hard hat and these cranes parked right next to this the this um uh, porter cabin area and there was a deck an elevated deck and then maybe three or four steps down onto the barge deck and after lunch, Jerry's coming out of the cabin and he's walking across the, the deck and he's put his hard hat on. So as soon as he's come out of his, his, the port cabin, he's put his hard hat on and he's walked down these three or four steps and he's going to get into his crane. And he was quite a big guy, Jerry. And uh, he lost his footing as he's coming down the steps. And I didn't see it myself, but apparently he just kind of lost his footing because he was quite heavy. He just, he, he sort of ran forward and he couldn't stop himself. And he ended up, you can't see, it wasn't at this time, so there was, there was some scaffolding on the barge deck here, small scaffold, and there was a scaffold uh, tube that should, probably should have had an end cap on it to protect it, uh, or to protect people from it, but it, I don't think it did. And Jerry ended up banging his head, he, was straight, he ran straight into the end of the scaffolding pole, and uh, like, like sort of rammed into it, and his heart, he put a hole in his heart and cut his head. But because he was quite heavy and the speed that he ended up running inadvertently running at we think that without the heartache it might it might well it would have certainly been a much more serious incident and it, we were all quite amazed he'd actually put his heart on because you know people do take shortcuts and you'd have thought going from the port cabin about five five maybe six meters to his crane he, he could have been forgiven for just carrying his heart up not putting it on um, so his good habits might well have saved his life on that day um, so this article here, worker falls from scaffolding on Hill, Hinkley Point. So this is obviously the nuclear power station that's being built at the moment. Um, this reminded me of the work I did at Sellafield. Uh, so we were building a, uh, well, it doesn't matter. We were building it, we were on a construction project and there was a scaffold there. I, I'm not sure, I can't remember how high it was, but it was at least two lifts high. And basically what happened is there was a handrail that was loose. And even though this scaffold would have been checked before that shift starting, um, a guy fell off the second lift of scaffold because he leant against the handrail and it gave way. And he fell apparently flat on his back and he was uninjured or certainly not seriously injured. Um, but it shouldn't have happened. And I think I've, I've called it taking care because there was a system in place and I, the, the, the scaffold system was called cup lock. Now, I'm, not a, I'm not a specialist on scaffolding, but I think that system's still in use. So I don't think there's a defect with the equipment. I think it was just, it hadn't been installed properly or it come loose and it hadn't been uh, identified so there was a problem of of care there and that shouldn't have happened okay working under suspended loads then so this wasn't really something i was aware of until i was working on this project in australia um but i just looked up on on the hse website what they say about this and and the quote is straight off the website so where it can be avoided, load should not be suspended over occupied areas. Where it cannot be avoided, the risk to people must be minimised by safe systems of work and appropriate precautions. Um, so when I was on this project in Australia, I was in charge of writing the methods. So basically coming up with uh, the installation procedure and construction methods for these structures here. Um, so, so this is a jetty and, and you'll see on, on most jetties, there'll be these structures, we call them dolphins, and basically either the ship bursts against them or it's moored to them, so they might be further back and, and the mooring lines from the ship. Uh, so it's basically holding the ship in place with the jetty uh, or, or, the, or the wharf, for example. So this was a real problem for me because when I got to Australia, I was told that you can't lift a load over somebody's head. And I, I think that's Australia-wide, that rule, um, so it's kind of a bit a little bit stricter than what the HSE is saying 
and maybe it was an oil and gas rule as well because we were, this was oil and gas sector and they were very strict on safety but it was a real problem for me because we had to install these precast initially precast concrete units onto piles so we'd start with a with piling so you'd have piles in this in the sea like this and then we had to install a precast unit on top of it so the first thing we'd do is we'd put some uh, walkways around around the piles and then we had to safely install these precast call we used to call them bath units because they're basically like a cube with the lid missing and they'd be lifted in onto the piles and then we'd fill eventually fill them with concrete and this was a real problem for me because i had to we had to have people standing on this on this platform and yet lift the load in without anybody being under it at any time so it was a little bit difficult uh, but I said, let's say I certainly worded my method statements right. It should have been possible to do this without putting the load over somebody's head. But then I contrast that with my prior experiences uh, where I'd not been really been aware of this, that I shouldn't be stood under a, a load, a suspended load. So I was quite I was a junior engineer, so I hadn't got a huge amount of experience on site at this time. But I certainly remember being on a project where there was three tower cranes and loads moving around all the time. And, and I managed to work on that job for over a year and not be aware of any issue with being stood under the suspended load. So what the failing, I mean, I can say that was at Sellafield, that project. So, and, that, and it was a good safety culture, I can say on, on that project. There was this issue with the handrail, but then this issue with suspended loads, I just wasn't aware of it. And maybe I just somehow managed to, to maybe it just gone over my head, so to speak. Um, but nobody ever mentioned to me, oh, you shouldn't be stood there or watch out or, there was nothing that I was aware of in the method statements about how we were building this job and we couldn't stand under suspended loads. So whether the rules were more lax or people didn't know what the rules were, uh, I don't know. And then still talking about lifting operations. So this is a uh, what we'd call a man cage or a man basket. Uh, so it's been fabricated and so designed and fabricated and, and tested uh, to safely take any loads that are on it to make sure that these people stay in the basket and the basket stays connected to the crane and everything's fine. Um, so let me move something. Um, the factors of safety when you design something like this are a lot higher than if you were, so this is a precast unit, so following on from the example I was just talking about. This has got four pickup points, so we'd call them lifting pins that would be cast into the concrete precast unit. And there's obviously factors of safety applied so that these lifting pins are strong enough so that these loads do not ordinarily regularly break and fall. Um, but they are, you have to use higher factors of safety for a, ma a man cage for obvious reasons. Um, and this also comes back to why you don't want to be stood under this because it's not been designed to be as safe as when you're lifting people. But I'm aware of projects and I'm still I'm going back 20, 20 years um, where People used to, so this unit will have been fabricated either on site or maybe off site, were brought to site on land and then put onto the barge deck. The barge would move away to out to position and then near these piles where the, this precast unit needs to be lifted to. And so the unit would be lifted off the barge deck and onto these piles. And like I say, it was a big problem for me because I had people stood on these platform and I want, needed to make sure they were safe. But I've been on a project where people would stand in this unit on the barge deck and then they'd be lifted with this unit onto the piles. Um, and I mean, that, that was on my first marine project. So I didn't, I was learning every day, you know, so I didn't realize it didn't strike me as being particularly unsafe. Um, but with hindsight, it, it was, it's certainly not the way it should, should have been done. And I think looking at, back at that project, the safety culture was quite poor. Uh, probably quite a few reasons for that but not least there was no health and safety representative on that side I and mean, it wasn't a big big project but it was big enough that there should have been a health and safety professional keeping an eye on things and there was no client representative on site either so basically the contractor had been left to just do the job as he sees fit which with the best one of the world usually comes down to cost and, and time um, so monitor so things like quality and safety would suffer uh in those circumstances and that, i think on that project they did so I've, I've identified that as a culture failure and similarly uh, this is uh so going back to these dolphins um these dolphin structures um 
you've got to get you've got to get people on on here. So you either use a man cage, but then you've got to land the man cage safely. So much easier generally to use boats, little personnel carriers, and you want a safe landing. So we designed temporary ladders. So they were designed, fabricated, fully cut CV well at this scale, but there's well testing's been carried out on this because it's a safety critical piece of equipment. So it gets temporarily attached to the pile and then it works at all, there was big tides on this project. So it has to work at all tides so that the boat would come and nudge up against it and safely allow people to transfer to this structure. Without a ladder like this, you end up with boats nudging either against the piles, but the trouble is with the waves, then things move. So especially when you've got a pile at an angle, it's quite easy quite common for the boats to like move unexpectedly away from the structure. You might end up with boats butting up against the scaffolding and the scaffolding has not been designed to take that load. And it, there's obviously a lot of danger with that compared to using a designed access point like this. And similarly on the barge here, you can see there's a landing been installed uh, with a, a, a similar ladder down and handrails, etc. But I've worked on projects where this just doesn't exist, where the boat, a, a, trans, a crew transfer boat would nudge up against the side of the barge and then you'd be expected to kind of scramble onto the deck. Um, again, that comes down to safety culture. Um, and then planning, I've called this planning experience. So here we've got a, a floating barge with a crane on it, typical work barge. We've got a piling hammer here. So this is the a big hammer basically used to, to, to drive the steel piles into the seabed. Um, so the piling hammer has been laid horizontally on the deck and then the crane has to pick it up and lift it and install it onto a pile. The pile's temporarily held by another system and then the hammer that like, hammers it into the, into the seabed. This was an incident. So I was on the barge, I was waiting for the piling to start. So I wasn't really involved with what was in the, this initial lifting operation. But what happened on this day is the as the crane tried to lift up the piling hammer, so it lifts up one end of it, leaves the other end on the deck, it swung round round the side. So it was lifting it here and it swung out, out of control. So obviously that could have had a big issue for the made a big problem for the crane. Um, could have damaged the crane, could have caused it to, to fall over. Um, luckily nothing serious came of this, but it was investigated as an incident. Um, so what, why did that happen? You could argue that the, the design of the, you know, having the hammer laid horizontally wasn't the safest way of doing this. It could have been a problem. It could have been the inexperience of the crane driver. I think it was a combination of the swell as well. So the, the floating barge is constantly moving. So that could combine with an actual tendency for this hammer to be unstable as it's lifted. So a much safer option would have been to use a barge like this, which we call a jack-up barge. Um, what it does is it basically lifts itself off the off the surface of the sea using four hydraulic legs and basically becomes like a, a, a tabletop on the seabed. Um, much safer, um, can work in all, well, not all, but it can work in quite rough seas, um, but it's a lot more expensive. You can also see here, incidentally, it's got its own piling hammer and that's in, it, in, a, in a rack. So when this crane lifts the piling hammer, it doesn't have to lay it down horizontally on the deck. So this has obviously been is a much safer place to be piling rather than on this barge here. If you want to make the marine operations even safer, you can design the equipment specifically for the work. So rather than having to make do with barges from other projects and standard equipment, on this particular job, which is in Papua New Guinea, the company built a specific piece of equipment to, to build this jetty. So this is basically building a jetty, but working from the land. And what it does is it, it supports itself on what it's built already, and then it cantilevers out and drives in new piles, and then eventually it places precast units onto them, and then it jacks itself along. So we ended up building a 2.4 kilometer long jetty from the shore without using any marine equipment for this part of the project, which, it's clear, it's not very repetitive, but you don't have to worry about tides and, and weather. So much. Obviously, high wind could affect the crane, but in terms of working on the sea, much, much safer, but more expensive. Uh, same project, different part of the job. 
Um, we're using a local contractor to build um, what was uh, a seawater holding tank. Uh, and this was my, I was responsible for this job. I, I got this local contractor, which was what I think was the best of, a, of a, the local available contractors. Uh, so they've done a little bit of work, they set up the site, and then we had a delivery of reinforcement steel, and it came on like this. Uh, a 10 mile journey it had made um, along the road, etc. and it's come like this. Uh, so again, it comes down to culture. So this is in Papua New Guinea probably not the highest safety standards ordinarily um, and it was horrifying for me <laughs> and the construction manager when this truck uh, turned up with the rebar um, no incident but we we lent for the next uh, we lent them our truck after this so they had a, a long a long truck uh, to bring the, the rebar to site um, another thing with this contractor is uh, when they were setting up the site I remember we went me myself and the construction manager went to have a look and see how they were getting on with the site setup and uh, they'd got a big sign next to the next to the port the, the site office the port cabin and it said master point and uh, I remember it stuck out in my mind because this, this was the assembly point so the, they meant muster point but I guess it, not their first language English, so they could be forgiven for, for making that mistake. But it kind of set the tone for things that were going on on, on that job. Okay, so um, this is the same project. So, so that contractor is working at uh, building a seawater a seawater storage tank. At the other end, we were had to we were basically had to pump seawater into a into a storage pond, and this was for a desalination plant. So it's quite an important job. And this is the little thing that I identified in the first photograph. So it's got this huge jetty, and there's this little seawater intake platform here that I was responsible for. Uh, so it was a little, a little job, but really important because this was early works, and it was supplying seawater for a desalination plant. And it was basically all the fresh water required for a, a 10,000 strong construction camp. Um, so no water, no no camp, no work, no project. So it was quite quite a lot of pressure. We we're under time pressure to finish the job. And what we have, have here, so we've got three pumps and we've got two HDPE, uh, it's a high density polyethylene pipes that we're gonna carry the water to shore. So later on, it looked like this, so the platform's out, out to sea, uh, this is, and this is the pipelines that we we're going to install. So we had a, an issue, because we're in the tidal zone, so we've got some on land, some in the sea, and then some in this intertidal zone. So installing this pipeline was quite a conundrum. So what I came up with was to come up with like something like like there, a sledge. And we we'd, we we prefabricate the pipes so they came in 12 meter sections and we weld uh, sorry six meter sections. We weld them together to make these strings of pipes. And then basically we we pulled this sledge out to sea. A string at a time, and then and then we welded strings on, and we, so we just did it like that. So this required it. We called it a pipe pull. So I was responsible for procuring, doing the design, procuring all the equipment. Um, so it was a real struggle getting a, a suitable winch. And as I say, we, we were short of time. So I, I found this winch. We installed it on the barge. We so this is the platform here. We installed. We had the barge positioned at the far side of the platform. We then we took the cable off this um off this um winch and we we towed the cable to shore we attached it to that sled that i showed you in the last slide and then we winched the pipe out to connect it to the pumps on the platform so this is it on its way so there this is in the intertidal zone there's our sledge the cables attached to the barge and our winch is, is pulling this out to sea so what was the issue then? Well, I, I was the engineer for this. I'd got this winch and it was a 30 ton winch. So that in engineering talk, that's 300 kilonewtons. I worked out, and this is very little, little more than back of the envelope calculation really that I could do, that I, it was needed 12 tons of force to pull this pipe, but it was very approximate calculation. The only wire we could get, or the, the wire that came on the winch was a 28 millimeter steel cable and that had a minimum breaking force of about 50 tons now the code of practice the australian standard 2759 tells you that the minimum breaking force 
has to be at least three times larger than the load. So what this meant was that our maximum permissible load was 16 and a half tons. But I've got a winch that's got a 30 ton capacity. So I was a bit uncomfortable about this. And the control measure we put in place was there was a there was a basically a pressure gauge, a pressure dial and gauge on the winch that was basically you could turn it up to maximum or turn it down. And that was how we controlled for this maximum permissible load while trying to respect the Australian standard. But the other thing was I wasn't sure exactly how much force we actually needed. So I was uncomfortable. The operation went okay and there was no incident, but I was uncomfortable that I was working properly within this standard because we were relying on the supervisor on site to make sure that the winch wasn't turned up too high. And this rope was second hand, you know, so this wire, so how strong really is it? You know, this is what it's designed for, but how strong is it now? So many years down the line. Um, so this was on me really. And I just remember feeling particularly uncomfortable and thinking, you know, I should have just insisted we got a bigger load. Um, but because of time pressure, it would have delayed the project and it would have delayed the entire project. Um, but I ended, so I ended up taking that calculated risk. And with hindsight, it was okay, but at the time I felt very uncomfortable about it. And then beyond calculated risk, there's also just unexpected events. So I'll look at the time. Um, okay, so uh, here we are with concrete. So what we're doing here, we're concreting inside a pile. We have to, we have to socket these piles into the seabed. Uh, so what we've got here is a, a hopper, where basically we've got what we call a skip that's of concrete that we're, down, we're, we're dropping into a hopper. And we've got a long pipe, because you can't just drop the concrete through the sea water, you have to deliver it at the bottom. So you've got a long pipe, and this pipe could be maybe 20 meters long. What we found on this job is we had a lot of blockages, concrete basically just getting stuck. So, we, so the, this hopper is just not emptying as it should. And on this particular day, and so th not this photograph, but on, a, on one particular day, the, it blocked up. And with the crane, we had to lift the hopper and the 20 meters of pipe and it's full of concrete and the guys here on this platform are trying to split the pipe so that the concrete so they can find the blockage and let the concrete out and I put unexpected events but with hindsight probably was foreseeable they split the pipe and concrete just shot out sideways from this joint that they split and the I think there was two two men on the platform that were doing this work they got covered head to toe in concrete and it Look, I was watching this in the barge, and it looked like quite a powerful jet of concrete. So I wouldn't say the guys were thrown back, but it's potentially that's what might have happened, because we just haven't planned for this kind of incident. Uh, so these guys had to get showered. They, they could have suffered concrete burns, but they didn't. But I think they're in danger of this uncontrolled concrete uh, blast, maybe throwing them against the handrails or, or worse. Uh, so that's just something where you think, what could possibly go wrong here? Because that just wasn't in the method statement. You know, we just didn't envisage any sort of issue like that. And then another one on the same project, we had some. Uh, so on this load, this is our loadout yard here. Um, we had some welders working in a little shelter. Uh, they were, I can't remember what they were doing. They were, they were welding something. These two welders in this little hot sort of tent that had been built for them, really close to the wharf. And what you can't see in this photograph is there's quite a steep hill at the back behind the person who's taking the photograph, quite a steep hill. Um, and what happened on one particular day is a truck not coming to our site, I think he might have been going uh, down here, which wasn't under our control or somewhere else. He was coming down this road, this access road. And I don't know if he missed a gear or something, but he was in a, a 12 or 15 ton truck and he basically lost control of it. And it came racing down into our site and narrowly missed this welding station and went straight off the wharf and into the water. And uh, the, the, we, we assisted, we, the, the, the driver got out. Uh, it's not, the water wasn't very deep here, maybe six or seven meters. Um, the driver got out. We ended up sending our divers down to retrieve his wallet and, and what have you. The, our crane lifted the truck out, but very close to these two welders that were working and completely oblivious to working this little shelter that would be built for them. Uh, so again, unexpected event. Um, so could that be could that have been planned for? I'm not sure, but um, it was an eye opener for quite a, quite a lot of us on, on the site that day. 
And then another additional risk that, that uh, you sometimes see. So here we've got um, we've got uh, some extra PPE. Uh, I would ordinarily ask out if I was in a, a in the in person living this. I'd maybe ask out. People can spot the extra PPE. Um, but anyway, so I'll, I'll tell you. So uh, our project manager here, he's got he's got some. Uh, sorry, I'm having a problem with my uh, mouse. He's got some snake gaiters on. So that was a risk in Papua New Guinea that you wouldn't encounter on, on, an, on an ordinary site, certainly not in the UK. So that was an extra piece of PPE required on that site, uh, snake gaiters, so that they basically would stand the snake bite without you getting, uh, without them getting to your skin. And Mo here, our construction supervisor, he's got a wide brimmed hat on, uh, which extends, covers the nape of his neck. He's also carrying a, a camelback water system, so he's got a constant supply of water because heat stroke was a big issue. This was in the northwest of Australia, where in summer the temperature would get to 40 degrees quite quite regularly, uh, quite high humidity as well. Um, so we did have a couple of uh, incidents of heat stroke on this project. Okay, so bringing Bringing that to a close, and so that, that's some, a snapshot of my uh, experiences of health and safety and managing health and safety um, in, in issues and incidents um, whilst I was working uh, on, in construction. Um, so climate change then, so I, I, it's something I'm really um, concerned about and passionate about. Um, and, and so if just look at the, the, the causes and the, and the risks of climate change here. So this is quite this is one version of quite a famous graph it's called the hockey stick graph this is carbon dioxide emissions going back 10,000 years fairly constant starts to rise um starts to rise sort of here since the, since industrial times particularly in the mid um mid 20th century since the mid 20th century we get this sharp increase of emission of, of uh, uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, so at this time when this graph was put together, uh, at 2005, we were at sort of 375, we're now at 420 uh, parts per million, so we're now sort of up here, so this is ca carrying on. And so what, what, what does that mean for us then? So we've got the, uh, the, the old polar bear, let's get the picture of the polar bear, don't we, on the melting ice, ice sheets, uh, heat waves, uh, wildfires, uh, bleaching of coral. Uh, droughts, the opposite of droughts, flooding. So that's I don't know if anyone is familiar with Centre of York, but that's a pub that floods has flooded regularly over the years, and it's flooding more often and, and with worse floods as uh, as we see the effects of climate change. Uh, this is from the US, so a particularly bad storm has lifted this house and, and moved it. So in terms of construction, then, so that's my focus is reducing emissions in construction. Uh, so buildings and infrastructure, around 40% of global carbon dioxide emissions are associated with the built environment. And they can broadly be split into the emissions that are embodied in the project, uh, in the in the uh, infrastructure, in the building, or whatever, whatever it is we're building, and then the subsequent operation of that of that asset. So 10% uh, of UK emissions are from construction activity. So that would include things like site use of uh, oil and gas, you know, diesel for plants, uh, and that possibly includes the embodied emissions from materials. So, for example, cement manufacture generates about 5% of global CO2 emissions. Um, due to these emissions, it's been worked out that a typical UK civil engineer has a carbon footprint of around 1,000 tonnes of CO2 per year. That compares to an average UK citizen's carbon emission footprint somewhere between five and 10 tonnes a year. So that's basically divvying up all these emissions between the number of civil engineers in the UK. So what's the what's, what's the industry doing about it? Well, there is initiatives like there's the civil engineers declare, uh, so that's we're declaring a climate emergency. So there's that initiative that, that's, that's um, uh, also for the, like the UK structural engineers and other professional bodies have declared similar uh, emergencies. There's the Institution of Civil Engineers. They support this initiative. They've also dedicated uh, publications and, and reports to um, to the issue of climate change. 
Um, there's standards that have come out, like there's one called PAS 2080, which is about managing uh, carbon emissions in construction. Um, but what we're doing is not at the scale required to meet our climate targets of net zero by 2050. Uh, it's not enough to make sure that infrastructure is resilient to the effects of climate change. And one observation I made quite a long time ago is the, the change that's happened in health and safety is the kind of change we need to see in uh, managing carbon emissions. So looking at how health and safety has been managed in construction, um, this graph is from um, a guy called uh, uh, Beal uh, in 2007, he was looking at the effects and limitations of the CDM regulations, the construction design and maintenance uh, management regulations. Uh, so he says the focus of this study is since this time, it, the improvement tapers off. But still, um, we have seen good improvement and, and we continue to see some improvement in, in uh, statistics, health and safety and construction. So, Basically, in the six, prior to the 60s, it was around 300 deaths a year. Recent HSE figures show around 30 deaths a year. So it's an order of magnitude improvement, um, but it's taken 60 years, really, since the 60s to get that sort of improvement. This is the sort of improvement we need in emissions. We really need to reduce our emissions by, you know, 90% or so um, in, in a maximum 30 years. Uh, but as soon as soon as possible, really. So the magnitude of change is, is correct, but we haven't got the time that it's taken to improve health and safety. So we can't allocate that same 60 years to the car carbon and uh, climate crisis. Um, and it, what's interesting is now, if you ask an engineer now how you need to stop emitting carbon when you build something, they're going to tell you that it's inevitable. You know, it's just, I'm sorry, but we're going to use cement, we're going to use diesel equipment. And it's inevitable. And it's good to look back at sort of the times of like the famous engineer Brunel. I read a, recently read a book about him and his achievements. And um, there was over 100 fatalities on one tunnel project, or one part of a, a part of a project, one tunnel, apparently cost 100 men their lives back in the 1800s. And it was any engineer in those days would have told you it's inevitable that people are going to die on every project. Um, so that sort of shows the shift in mindset and culture that can happen and that's what we really need uh, in climate change management so following on from uh Beale saying that well in the last sort of 10 15 years since cdm nothing, you know there's not been that big an improvement but the improvements that have come come that have continued to happen in health and safety have been attributed so i i, I refer to some uh, uh research that i i've looked at it's been attributed based to the development of knowledge management systems and a shift in focus from enforcement based sort of rule, applying rules and telling people what to do to an improvement in culture. Um, it's recognised that the construction sector is uniquely complex, like pretty much every job's different, every team's different. So there's not the same continuity that you see in other industries. And improving health and safety outcomes by improving culture comes down to effective knowledge transfer, so like learning lessons, openness to learning, and behavioural change programmes. So that's according to research by uh, Dewey and uh, AL in 2020. So going back to my research question, so which methods, techniques, learnings, and plans over many years to improve health and safety could help the construction sector achieve its climate-related objectives? So I'm expecting that we will meet targets, we've got targets, we will need them, but we, that's not enough. We need to change the culture uh, and we need to focus on the people that can make the biggest difference. So one hypothesis I've got is in health and safety, the guys on site play a big part. You know, PPE plays a big part and, and actions of the people at the coalface makes, ultimately makes a big difference. In climate change, I would suggest that it's more the design stage and deciding whether we need assets in the first place or whether we can we can come up with some way of not having to build at all and then once we're building something then obviously we can change the materials we can look at different ways of working to reduce emissions so that's my hypothesis and i am now going to interview civil engineers and see what they think and come up with some 
hopefully some consensus on on how we can improve climate change without or climate change uh, object how we can achieve our objectives without relying on 60 years of kind of trial and error which we've had to go through with uh, health and safety okay so that's it that's that's all from me so uh, i'll hand back to is it, is it jane Yeah, thanks for that, John. Really, uh, really informative and some some challenging uh, messages, I think, for all of us there. Um, I've noticed that nobody's really put any questions in the chat. Um, so if anybody's got any questions for John, if you just want to speak up and uh, we'll we'll try and make sure we cover them all off. Yeah, I mean, before. I just want to add, you know, just to remind you, I'm not a health and safety professional and I imagine most of you are. So this is just my perspective, so I don't, I certainly don't want to sound like I'm sort of authoritative on health and safety and construction. It's just my observations and I really would welcome your input into, I mean, maybe maybe people out there think there are no lessons to be learned from health and safety for, for carbon management, but I suspect there are. Uh, so the more, the more ideas that are put put out there the better really. No, I think I think it's an interesting an interesting point, John. I think one of the things is that those of us that have worked um, either in construction or indeed in health and safety uh, for a number of years have seen some real cultural shifts in people's behaviours and and attitudes towards health and safety. Sometimes that's driven by legislation. Uh, it's driven by enforcement of rules. Sometimes it's something that evolves as people start to realise the benefits. I think one of the challenges for climate change is that most of us probably don't anticipate seeing the benefits within our lifetime. And I think we need to start thinking differently about, you know, it's our children's lifetime, our grandchildren's lifetime, as opposed to what we will realise within 20, 30 years. Um, so I think, you know, you've made some really, really good points there. And I think there are parallels between the um, the cultural shifts that's th that are needed uh, to affect climate change versus, versus the cultural shifts uh, that we've already seen and continue to see in health and safety. Emma? Yeah, apologies. I had um, I didn't have it on mute then, and you can hear all the noise in the background of where I'm sitting. Um, all I wanted to say was, in the last couple of weeks, I've noticed four jobs that aren't just chef. They've got uh, sustainability on them as well now, because we seem to be an industry where we just add things to the title. Um, and it's just an interesting one because I think there could be a lot of us or a lot of our colleagues out there who get this as part of their job role in the future. And actually, lessons learnt from safety generally are going to be applied because you've got that as an extra remit so it was just that really just you know completely unconnected to this that i've seen jobs with sustainability added we're gonna have such a long acronym soon we're gonna to have to create a new word i think <laughs> i think i think that's a great important point actually yeah that that it's, it, it will be and certainly initially on site it'll be the health and safety department that well it is being done isn't it environment i mean it, it, in Australia, when I was out there, it was a she's department, safety, health, environment, and security. Um, and that's 10 years ago. Um, so I think that's a good point. But I think it begs the question of like whether they need extra expertise. You can't expect someone whose background is health and safety to be an expert on managing carbon emissions. So I think it needs, but, but obviously the, the learning, the, the culture side and how to educate people on site that comes from health and safety, I think that would be really useful to get to get that same uh, expertise and experience. Any more questions from anybody? Stunned silence. A lot to a lot to think about. We've got one in the uh, the chat we've picked up uh, from Mike Deegan. Um, I work in the shipping industry. 
uh, where I'm responsible for safety across a diverse fleet of 36 ships. I noted many of the risks you highlighted, including lifting equipment on a moving platform, safe access to a floating structure, et cetera, in the marine projects, had parallels in the shipping industry where we are equally challenged. Are you aware of any crossover of ideas between civil engineering, offshore projects, and the maritime industry? Hmm. <laughs> I just want to say no to that. Um, no, I mean, we shipping, I never really had much exposure to it. Near the end of the, the marine projects, we might we'd be putting navigation aids in and then maybe we'd see the first vessel come and do a trial load. But apart from that, you know, I looked at the working of tugs. But apart from that, I've not really had any exposure to like marine operations, like off, at proper shipping. Um, mm. So I haven't really, I haven't really got any experience with that. But I, I mean, we've seen heavy lifting. So where we've had some equipment, more and more now, um, places like Australia where the cost of labour is high. There's a lot of off-site fabrication in, in like Thailand, uh, Malaysia. So you get the, a lot of the what would have been concreted on site at one time is now fabricated out of steel and then shipped. So you've got heavy lifting. So I've had some experience of like heavy, like over a thousand ton lifts um, of things that would have ordinarily been built on site. Uh, but now I've not really got any experience of like health and safety management during, during shipping. But there's big challenges for uh, reducing emissions from shipping but that's kind of a separate a separate topic okay a uh, question from pete charlesworth um another driver of improvement in health and safety and general environment has been the take-up of iso standards is this something that enters your thoughts around climate change um I mean, there are sustainability standards, but they tend to be quite industry specific. So for instance, forestry standards and things like that. But I mm. think Pete's asking, is there something more ge generic that could be applied? The only standard I'm aware of that's been applied at the moment is the PAS 28, which is a UK standard, which is basically just like consider you have to put a baseline in, so you uh, so you say like this is our project. You do a you do a measurement. So you come up with what would it like a traditional design. So it's like oh, I'm going to build a jetty. How would it normally be done? So there's obviously can be a lot of different opinions on what's what your standard your baseline is. But you you say like how many emissions? What what's the carbon impact? What's the climate impact of this project? Like what are we going to do to improve that? So then you've got targets to try and improve it. But obviously you it's done by the project usually. So, so they don't want to set the bar too high by saying, oh, ordinarily, ordinarily we do really well and get and, and be really efficient. So they're going to say, oh, ordinarily we'd be really inefficient, so then you can get some easy wins. But anyway, that's kind of the game and that's the process. But it is it is a good piece of legislation. But in terms of ISO standards, I'm not aware of anything um, not specifically to, to reducing carbon emissions. It might be something that... that that comes in in the future, um, you know, if, well, I think, if, if the cultural I think shift when, when you, fast enough. Yeah, I mean, when we have these these yearly um, climate conferences, like the COPs, conference of parties, the different sectors get together. I mean, I've never been to one, but the different sectors that will be represented for the built environment from different countries. So I think that's where it will be noted that the UK is done particularly well, for example, and they're using this past 2080. So then I think I could see something developing more international, certainly the sharing of the, those ideas. So there could be like a best practice could could come, come to fruition through, through that sort of annual comparison between different countries. Okay. Uh, we've got one from Kate Lavender. Um, she's saying not so much the carbon aspect, um but how do we manage the messaging and communication so she's making note that you've worked on many international projects how did you manage the language barriers and were there any particular methods that worked better than others and i suppose it's not just language barriers perhaps cultural differences as well yeah so the language um 
and obviously in Australia, in, in Papua New Guinea, they spoke good English generally. So they had like they had a lot of languages there, but they generally spoke pidgin English and English. Um, I did the job in Costa Rica. A lot of the guys on site were, didn't speak English; they spoke Spanish. But I was dealing mainly with um, with uh, Dutch and uh, Dutch supervisors or Costa Ricans that could speak reasonable English. But it is there's certainly a cultural difference. So, and certainly the health and safety, the guys on site need to understand. There's no point you come up with a great method of doing something that's nice and safe. The guys on site can't understand it. Uh, they can't understand you explaining it, or they can't understand it, what's written down, and they just do what they normally do. So um, there is obviously that cultural and language barrier that has to be overcome. Um, I can't remember any the other point, the, the other question, the other part of the question. Well, it just really was there anything that worked particularly well um, where you found um, differences in, you know, where you found a language barrier or, or whatever. So I think you've answered. I think you've answered that one. I think perhaps to uh, to help there. I mean, personally, I've worked on construction sites mainly around Europe. Um, we had a float glass plant built at Goul um, for Guardian Industries. Um, and that was a multilingual site. We'd got Portuguese speakers, Spanish speakers, um, Germans, French, uh, and and various dialects of all of those languages. Uh, but what we found made the biggest difference was not so much the language because we were always able to find somebody on the site who could interpret who could we used a lot of pictograms in the way that we presented information and so on but we did have um fluent speakers on site who could interpret the biggest issue was not so much the language it was the cultural differences um so we encountered numerous um drivers lorry drivers crane drivers and so on who were coming in from mainland europe um who absolutely flat refused to wear ppe and actually turned up to site in shorts sandals open toed sandals um all sorts of things like that so that was actually more of a challenge than the the language itself it was it was more a, you know trying to understand why their expectations were so different when they came onto a, a UK construction site, when we, you know, EU standards should have applied right across, right across the piece. Um, well, and to be honest, I don't think we ever really resolved it. It was it was a matter of challenge in every event um, until we got the right um, the right response. Yeah, I was going to say, Susan, that just a case of just saying, look, you know, work if you dress like that. You have to exactly. Work yeah. And then yeah. after a certain amount of time, everyone just toes to the line. Yeah. And, 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 you know, sometimes that meant that people were financially impacted. So quite often you'd have drivers who had probably done a mainland Europe trip before they came to us. Um, but they'd bring, you know, the wife, possibly a child, a dog, <laughs> um, you know, because that was that was their sort of monthly routine that they'd start in one part of Europe, do a full round trip and end up back home. Um, so part of that was bringing fa family with them um, and trying to explain to a driver whose first language isn't English that actually you can't have your child running around uh, on a construction site. You can't can't let your dog loose on a construction site. You know, you need to find somewhere safe off site um, for them to be. Um, was quite challenging at times. So, um, Stanley Joseph has asked, uh, can you please provide some idea or information regarding alternative materials in construction with low carbon emissions? Uh, well, timber is the obvious choice. So certainly for buildings, it would be really good to move and, and there is a there is a move towards timber frame but they were still using a lot of materials that could be timber and should be timber um in more heavy work where where we traditionally using steel and concrete and we have to keep using steel and concrete there's some interesting developments but a lot of it is is it's still at research or pilot stage but um the st steel can be made 
Um, so it's, it's like the blast. So you using iron, you've got to get iron out of iron ore and then and then turn it into steel. There's a low carbon ways of doing that, so that you can use hydrogen instead of coking coal. But that's not really been scaled up anywhere, I don't think. But but it's, there's a lot of projects in development for doing that. You can use um, electricity. Um, but again, so it, it, the the industry is starting to look at these different solutions. So hopefully it's soon low carbon steel will be available at the scale and price that's required because there's just not the appetite or that it's not affordable to pay a green premium for steel there's only certain projects or maybe you know maybe by like the apple or google might build a, a new facility and can say it's using local and they can afford to use low carbon steel perhaps but not generally uh, but so that's coming and cement's the same as well. So low carbon concrete. So, I mean, going back to what I was saying about how past 2080 works and you say, this is the baseline and then we can b do better than that. So there's an argument of what's baseline concrete because for a long time, um, there's been a lower carbon version of concrete where some of the cement is swapped for uh, blast furnace slag and um, fly ash, which are waste products from, from um, steel making, for example. Uh, and that already lowers, that has other advantages and lowers the carbon emissions because a lot of the carbon emissions in concrete is cement. But some people will ignore that and say, well, no, the baseline is like full, full cement concrete. So then any gains they can make on that is a win. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, but, but then there's further low carbon concrete. So, so like zero carbon concrete is a possibility. Um, but again, there's, there's different ways of achieving that, uh, but, and there's a quite a lot of uh, pilot projects and research going on into that. But so we could use more, we could use a lot more timber. And the, the main thing, and I did mention it, is deciding when what you need to build. You know, our default thing is to build, you know, congestion, or we need more roads. And like there's, in the news about Wales, basically said we're not going to build any more roads now unless there's a really strong environmental case for it. Uh, so uh, that's going to play out. I think it's going to be quite interesting to see how that, that plays out politically. Uh, but they're really relying on good public transport. Well, basically, the idea is well, we don't need a new road, basically. So that, that's the best solution from a carbon perspective, is let's just manage that. You know, let's put more buses on and let's build or expand the railways. And we're not, you know, we're not going to have all these road, road projects being built. Um, so yeah, thanks for your question. Yes, yeah, so there is there are low low carbon materials are coming through, but not fast enough at the moment. But I think there's a lot of money going in, into it because it's massive. The amount of um, concrete is the most abundant man-made material. More it's, it, after water, I think it's the most abundant material that we use. Something like that. that was a crazy statistic. Like, the huge amount of concrete is used every year. There's no way it's all going to become wood. Um, so we need we do need low carbon solutions. Right. Well, that seems to be the end of the questions in the chat, John. Um, I can't see anybody else trying to sort of come into the conversation. So um, if we bring the presentation to a close, um, if I could ask the branch committee members to stay on the call. Um, everybody else, thank you very, very much for your time and for your participation this afternoon. I hope you found that interesting. Um, some challenging questions there, I think. Thank you. Always takes a while for people to dial off. There's one or two people asking for your contact details in the yeah, chat. Yeah, just one of them now. Is that? Uh, I mean, I don't mind.
want to yeah stanley joseph and um phil phil keeling is that can you arrange that or should i contact them um i can i can pick up after the meeting um and get the contact details and then put put them in touch with you that's probably the best if you don't mind Jane, that'd be great yeah Thank you. and then you're not bombarded with people <laughs> Do you need me to hang around, Jane, or do I? Do I... Um, it's entirely up to you. I'm just waiting for the the remaining people to uh, to dial off. Down to the last eight or so now. Some people have probably gone to make a cup of tea. I'm going to say, I've started to remove people oh, now. Hopefully they haven't fallen People <laughs> drift off, but leave the, uh, leave the laptop connected. <laughs> Nearly there. Oh, nice comments anyway, so that's nice. Yeah, I think generally well received, so well done. So. Oh, thank you. It's, a bit, you know, it's not something I've spoke about before in this context, so um, obviously I wanted to try and keep it sort of health and safety focus but that's not as i said that's not really my background but no and it's sometimes it's better to um to have somebody with a different you know different lived experience really i think it gives you know it gives it more impact we're nearly there well yeah certainly when i thought about it you know what have i experienced on site in health and safety you know it came up with a lot of it there was other things i could have put in as well but i could have done with finding more photographs i didn't always have good photographs but i was trying to keep away from like bullet, uh, i think, I think bullet photographs bullet. always yeah i think photographs always work right i think it's just me you and emma now so um i'll stop the recording